uh, course. Uh, we have been uh, talking about the uh, first nuclear reactor and the birth of the nuclear age. And uh, we reached the stage where both the approaches followed by uh, General Leslie Grove and uh, Robert Oppenheimer were uh, successful. And uh, in that case, they had access to two materials that can fission, uranium-235, with the work that was done at the uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, and uh, as well as plutonium-239 from the site at the Hanford uh, site. So now we have uh, available to us both plutonium-239 and uranium-235 as fissile materials that could be used in the Manhattan Project uh, as intended as an explosive device. Remember that uh, the fear was that Germany uh, would get involved in that uh, process because fission uh, was discovered uh, in Germany. Uh, however, at uh, the time of the success of uh, uh, the sub obtaining the supply of uranium-235 and plutonium-239, uh, uh, was at the time where the war in Europe ended, uh, Germany uh, surrendered, and uh, uh, however, the war continued in the Pacific. Uh, these are two pictures of the uranium-235, uh, enriched uranium in that case, enriched meaning that it's in uh, the concentration of uranium-235 is could be up to the level of 95%, whereas uh, in the assignment that I gave you at the chart of the nuclides, you'll find that in nature, uranium-235 is only 0.72%. And for the two purposes of uh, 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 naval propulsion and making weapons, they need to increase that enrichment of uranium-235 in uranium up to the level maybe of 95%. Uh, for existing nuclear power plants, the enrichment is in the range of three to 5% as we are going to learn later. It is in the form of a puck because if it were in the form of a sphere, as uh, the same as a shape that the uh, experimenters on the Chicago pile number one were trying to reach as a, uh, 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 the sphere geometry, uh, in that case would have a minimum leakage of all the geometrical objects. So uh, the system can become super critical and the chain reaction would occur. That's why they have it in the form of a flat puck. So increase the leakage of neutrons uh, in the system from uh, 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 spontaneous fission, particularly in plutonium. This is a puck of that uh, plutonium puck. So now we have plutonium-239, fissile material, as well as uranium-235. Uh, plutonium-239 has a property of fission uh, occurring uh, all uh, by itself. So they had to test the, uh, the uranium-239, uh, plutonium-239 isotope in what has been called the Trinity test. The name was given to it by Robert Oppenheimer. Uh, the scientists involved in the project knew about the destructiveness of such a device and they wrote a petition uh, now declassified uh, to the President of the United States on July 17, 1945, suggesting that the uh, weapon that they were working on should be tested before used on the, uh, in the war on Japan. And ironically, uh, Mr. Leo Zillard, who had written originally the letter to President Roosevelt with uh, Albert Einstein, uh, suggesting the start of the Manhattan Project was the one who led the effort in uh, writing that petition. Uh, the issue was debated and they ended up uh, deciding basically to use the uh, two materials, uranium-235 uh, on the city of uh, Hiroshima uh, in Japan and uh, the plutonium-239 uh, on the city of Nagasaki in Japan. Uh, this is uh, an assumed uh, configuration for a device that would use plutonium-239. Because of the spontaneous fission, uh, a sphere of plutonium in the center here had to reach critical mass real fast at the speed of sound. And you can achieve that only by using explosives. So these are explosive lenses surrounding the core 
made out of plutonium-239. This is a picture from uh, the book, The Curve of Binding Energy book by uh, uh, and the author is a scientist, Damo. We'll talk about him later on uh, in his book uh, that you can find in the underground, uh, the underground library. Uh, this is a mock-up of those devices and uh, they had to, re uh, to raise the test, uh, the Trinity test device here, you could see it's a shape of a sphere. So it used plutonium and an implosion process uh, uh, on top of a tower. Uh, electronics had to be used with initiators that had to initiate all the explosive lenses exactly at the same timing. Otherwise, the head, uh, head of dynamics would not work. And this is uh, a picture of the device in a museum at Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. Uh, of the, that first device. Uh, the explosion uh, happened uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, basically very early uh, in the morning on top of the tower. Uh, the fission energy release uh, uh, ionized the gases, the nitrogen uh, uh, and the oxygen in the atmosphere and created a fireball. That fireball expanded at the speed of sound. Uh, there was a reflection from the ground that uh, created a superposition with the incoming shockwave from the top of the tower. And in that case, it led to a stem or a shockwave that propagated horizontally. And that's what uh, lead, leads uh, to the destructiveness of uh, a nuclear device. If it's exploded the, on the ground, uh, the shockwave will simply dissipate up into uh, up in the atmosphere and not, not, not cause uh, any uh, harm. As that uh, fireball rises, it sucks the dust uh, from the ground uh, and basically turn into a, a torus uh, form and the gases keep rising in the typical mushroom uh, that we know. However, the neutrons from the reaction uh, turn the material on the ground and the materials of the device itself into very highly radioactive materials. So those, that dust rises into the atmosphere and then the wind would propagate it all over the Earth, causing great harm from the fission products as well as the activated Earth that is sucked up in the mushroom and uh, uh, the uh, effect uh, would be felt all over the world. The Trinity test or the testing of the plutonium uh, material or device uh, happened on July 16, 1945, very early at dawn, 5.29 uh, in uh, the morning. Came then the uh, uh, process of uh, the discussion of uh, how to end the war. Uh, in the appendix, uh, their uh, historians are uh, debating whether uh, the nuclear weapon should be have been used or not uh, to uh, uh, to uh, in in the war against Japan. That is left to the historians to debate, but uh, and the debate is. Uh, very contemptuous and it is continuing uh, uh, until uh, today. Uh, for the use of uranium-235, all you had to do uh, is create a critical mass. So uh, because it doesn't have the same level of spontaneous fission as plutonium-239, so you could achieve a critical mass by having two hemispheres of uranium-235 uh, surrounded by a tamper. Uh, uh, to keep the expansion confined and the uh, material uh, 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 combined together. And uh, you can use a, a typical simple gun barrel uh, uh, from guns and have two pieces shot into each other. Or you can have one piece stationary and shoot another piece into it to reach a critical mass. That would be half a critical mass and that would be another half of a critical mass. This concept is called the gun barrel concept, and it was uh, uh, more or less along the line of having a sphere uh, surrounded by a tamper and the gun barrel will shoot uh, an extra piece of uh, material, uh, the uranium-235, followed by a piece of tamper reaching a supercritical mass. In fact, uh, for a reason of, si and this is uh, the device as it looked, this is the actual device, in fact, the picture of the actual device that was dropped on Hiroshima in Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, you could see the cylindrical shape of it. This is a replica in a museum. 
And the suggestion is that uh, for uh, uh, arming the device, you would have not a simple piece of uranium-235, but you'll have three pieces, uh, three rings, in fact, uh, separated by boron carbide. Boron carbide, the boron absorbs neutrons, so you don't have a chain reaction there. And then you get a pro uranium projectile in the gun barrel, shoot it, displace that boron out from the three rings, combine the three rings together. This is basically arming the device, and you would have basically transportation that is safe. And uh, the, uh, that device, uh, uh, because the critical mass of uranium-235 is larger than the one for plutonium-235, apparently not many devices use that approach uh, because it would use a, a large amount of uranium-235. Uh, the plutonium-239, uh, since it had that spontaneous fission uh, that could fizzle the reaction if the reaction starts too early, uh, uh, would have used the implosion process. So you would have a casing, you would have a temper surrounding a mass of plutonium-239, and uh, you basically surround it with the explosive lenses and compress the uh, core. Uh, and, uh, and you, as you compress the core, the nuclei come very close together. They surmount their Coulomb repulsion and uh, uh, a chain reaction is started. It could be a solid core like here, uh, shown here. It could be a shell uh, or it could be a porous material that uh, you compress to a very high uh, uh, density. Uh, the uh, device that uh, used the gun barrel concept had a name, they gave it a uh, a code name, it was called Little Boy, and the device that used the implosion process and plutonium-239 was given uh, also a code name that was Fat Man. So the gun barrel concept shown earlier here <coughs> uh, was uh, a device that was used on Hiroshima, and uh, this is the one, actually the actual device picture. Uh, you could see it has the shape of a gun barrel. Uh, and the one that uh, was used on Nagasaki used the plutonium-239. And uh, uh, it was called Fat Man. This is also a picture of the actual uh, device. Uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> uh, and uh, in fact, uh, 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 Hiroshima uh, uh, was bombed. This is, uh, these are two pictures. Uh, this is the mushroom that rose out, taken out from the plane, uh, a B-29 that dropped the device uh, uh, on August 6, 1945. This is the one that was dropped on Hiroshima. And uh, this is a picture of the one that was dropped over Nagasaki. Just three days later, from August 6, 1945 to August 9, 1945. Uh, at the time, Japan uh, already was uh, seeking an end, uh, uh, a negotiated end for the war. Uh, they were fearful of Russia entering the war and uh, uh, getting basically hold of the J northern Japanese islands. So very quickly, uh, the use of uh, the devices ended uh, the war uh, in, uh, uh, in the Pacific uh, in general. Uh, these are pictures from the Smithsonian institution of that little boy uh, device. You could see it here being loaded on the B-29. Uh, the pilot of the Enola, uh, the plane gave it the name Enola Gay. Enola Gay was the name of his mother. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of those planes, either the Enola Gay or the one that was used for the uh, other, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the Enola Gay or the or the one used for Nagasaki is uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Institute uh, Museum. So if you visit Washington DC, you may be able to find it there. Uh, the explosion uh, caused great harm. Uh, it caused x-rays. Uh, this is a picture of people who survived the explosion. Uh, you could see that the x-rays were absorbed in the uh, clothing of one uh, of the victims of the explosion in the dark areas, the X-rays were absorbed and caused uh, very uh, severe uh, burns in that case. Uh, and uh, uh, the X-rays preferentially are absorbed in the dark closing areas. And these are some of the victims of so this devastation was horrendous. Uh, if you look very closely here, you could see that 
the blast wave destroyed the structures, but then the X-rays uh, uh, and the infrared radiation caused fires. So the fires uh, uh, after the structures were uh, destroyed by the blast wave, the fires destroyed the rest of it. And uh, this is a picture here. You can see this is really a fire truck. So there was no way of saving the situation. Uh, some of the concrete structures, as you could see here at uh, Hiroshima, survived the uh, bombing, but uh, 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 you could see that uh, this is now what is, uh, was named at the time, actually ground zero, and the name continues to be uh, used. Some people have been foraging there in the area. Uh, oops, I jumped. <clears throat> Uh, uh, as I suggested, the <clears throat> uh, some of the concrete structures uh, survived it, and that uh, concrete structure is kept as a memorial. Uh, that picture was uh, sent to me by one of the students. Uh, it is the UNESCO Heritage Museum, and President Obama went there uh, during uh, his uh, uh, term in office and uh, gave a rec reconciliation uh, kind of speech uh, to uh, Japan. Uh, they call it the Genbaku building. Uh, it was a concrete uh, movie theater. Uh, the skeletal remains only are kept as a memorial of the bombing in, uh, of the victims in Hiroshima. Uh, these are other pictures that have come up uh, lately. You could see that in the area of the explosion, people went there, uh, small, small kids uh, maybe, foraging uh, for whatever remains they found. Uh, the uh, device that was dropped on Nagasaki was also in a B-29 uh, uh, and the pilot names his... Uh, 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 he named his uh, plane box car and you could see that the device dropped on Nagasaki had the plutonium device, so it's being uh, loaded into the bay of the bomber. Uh, uh, unfortunately, as I'll come at the end of the lecture, uh, the parts uh, of the uh, devices were sent on uh, a cruiser, uh, the Indianapolis, uh, to the Tinian Islands in the Pacific to be uh, assembled and uh, another tragedy other than the bombings happened in general. Uh, Nagasaki uh, had a mountainous uh, at, uh, landscape, so the shock waves from the explosions did not affect Nagasaki as much as they affected the uh, Hiroshima area. Uh, this is the remnants of a ca Catholic cathedral on the left and a Buddhist temple on uh, the right. But the devastation was tremendously uh, large. This is a picture of the ground blast effects uh, in Nagasaki, and we would like to read more about it uh, in the text. Now, uh, if you have uh, nuclear devices, uh, that effect depends on how much energy you release in the device, which we call the yield. And in the last lecture, we defined what is a, uh, uh, a ton of TNT equivalent. TNT is a high explosive tri nitro, nitro toluene. So uh, if you have a one kiloton explosive, you'll find that you get a size of the fireball, uh, basically, uh, uh, say, a relative size of 10. If you go to the 10 kiloton, that was uh, at the size almost 10 to 20 kilotons, where the size of the two devices on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you get a fireball diameter of 200 meters. And the uh, current uh, devices are in the range of 100 kilotons, so you get a fireball uh, of 500 uh, meters in size. However, the shock wave uh, can extend all the way to 2000 uh, uh, meters. This is uh, the ranges in meters here. Uh, you get the prompt radiation dose that could be lethal, 500 rem uh, or centi uh, sievert. Uh, uh, we'll define that unit as we learn more about uh, radiation physics. Uh, and uh, uh, from 100 kiloton TNT, basically, uh, the, it's 1,500 uh, centisievert. Uh, the explosion is associated with a heat flux of 4,700 calories per centimeter squared. So it's not just a blast wave or a shock wave, a piston 
that comes out destroying structures, uh, followed in fact uh, by rarefaction. So you compress and then you uh, place the structure in tension. Uh, the uh, effects of nuclear devices are empirically written as a function of the yield. So if you write the yield in kilotons of TNT equivalent, you can calculate the radiation thickness R in meters, the blast shockwave radius, the thermal infrared radius. So basically the numbers in the uh, table here is, uh, are obtained from that expression. Uh, how destructive are nuclear weapons? Uh, nuclear uh, <clears throat> incendiary bombing of Tokyo happened uh, uh, before the uh, use of the atomic bombs. So uh, on Tokyo, uh, there has been 1,667 tons of uh, TNT and incendiaries dropped. And uh, Tokyo, of course, has a pop large population, uh, density 130,000 people per square mile. Uh, Nagasaki had a uh, uh, half uh, the density of the population and Hiroshima half of that of uh, Nagasaki. However, uh, depending uh, on the use of the devices, uh, in Hiroshima, 4.7 square miles were destroyed, Nagasaki, two square miles, but Tokyo had 16 square miles destroyed by conventional bombing with incendiaries. Basically, what they did is that they generated a firestorm like uh, what happened in Germany on, uh, uh, on uh, Hamburg and uh, Dresden. I'll show you pictures of it. Uh, the, there have been, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the victims of Hiroshima were 70,000 uh, direct uh, deaths and 140,000 thought to be long-term from the effect of uh, the dose of radiation. Nagasaki, 36,000. But uh, the bombing of Tokyo with incendiary bombing uh, was also very uh, serious. 83,000 were uh, victims in general. However, uh, the mortality per square mile is uh, much uh, larger. So if you have the incendiary bombing, the mortality per square mile is 5,000. Uh, it's four times as much from the nuclear bombing in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So bombing, whether it's with incendiary bombing or with nuclear devices are not equally, but they are both uh, basically very destructive. Uh, the idea uh, of the incendiary bombing is shown here uh, uh, earlier on that was uh, used in Germany uh, on February 13, 15, 1945 at the city of Dresden from the top of their cathedral. Here you could see the destruction. Uh, the incendiary bombing depleted the atmosphere of oxygen. So even people who tried to seek shelter in underground shelters basically were suffocated for the lack of oxygen. So it's a dreadful situation, whether it is nuclear bombing or uh, conventional uh, bombing. Uh, something interesting, uh, of course, uh, uh, happened uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, meetings at the city of Yalta uh, among the allies uh, uh, and post them, uh, the leaders, uh, Churchill and Stalin, and uh, uh, met and basically divided the world among uh, the victors uh, in that case. Uh, a third, uh, another strategy followed, as I suggested, the Indianapolis uh, cruiser, named after the city of Indianapolis in Indiana, shown here, uh, carried the parts for the for the <coughs> uh, for the bombs to the Tinian Island, and the process was kept secret even from the top grass in the Navy uh, itself. Uh, upon its return, nobody knew about its mission. Uh, it was intercepted by uh, a, a, a Japanese submarine and uh, basically it was sunk on July 30, 1945. If you watch or go and rent the uh, movie Shark, uh, 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 Jaws, uh, you'll find that there is a description of the tragedy of those sailors remaining in the water for several days being attacked and picked up by sharks uh, we're without uh, basically any form of defense and no help available until by chance a, an observation plane uh, discovered them and the, the survivors were uh, rescued. 
uh, the Navy uh, basically court-martialed the uh, captain of the ship, uh, uh, Captain McVeigh, uh, and he committed suicide, but his crews uh, later on get him uh, basically cleared by act of Congress. Uh, every year, the, what the survivors of the Indianapolis uh, were uh, meeting at Indianapolis uh, as some kind of uh, a memorial kind of meet. This is the uh, results of the Trinity test. Uh, that's Robert Oppenheimer shown here. And uh, General Leslie Grove, the tower uh, in which the test was conducted was totally evaporated, as you could see, leaving a big hole in the ground. Uh, if you visit uh, uh, New Mexico, uh, you'll find that there is a memorial set there at the Trinity site. Uh, uh, one of our students in this class 402 uh, uh, has been working in our military base there and sent us a picture, but you can visit the site. Uh, it is open to the public only once a year on the first Saturday of October. So if you visit it, send me a picture of yourself next to the uh, site. So this is how uh, the, uh, the first uh, uh, introduction of nuclear energy, unfortunately, to the world was uh, in uh, warfare. We hope that uh, it's not going to happen again, and uh, that was the only two instances in that case. If you want to read more about the uh, historical aspects of it, I invite you to read the uh, appendix, uh, but I'm not going to uh, expand on it. Uh, uh, many people uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, are discussing whether the nuclear weapons have been, should have been used or not, according to very prominent people like General Eisenhower came out, who became President Eisenhower, came uh, against it. But some uh, arguments suggest that it helped save uh, both military and civilian lives by uh, shortening the war with Japan. Uh, the discussion is ongoing, uh, and uh, I invite you simply to uh, read the material here. Uh, this uh, is what happens. Uh, uh, the destructiveness of an 800 kiloton nuclear warhead, if it is detonated, uh, is, uh, theoretically, obviously, above Manhattan Island. Uh, you'd have a fireball that would cover most of the island. Uh, the horizontal sh shockwave will destroy all the buildings, and the destructiveness could be just tremendous. So uh, nuclear war is one of the uh, extinction events for the human race in the same way that we have pandemics, uh, viruses, uh, and the global warming, and humanity has those hurdles to overcome. Now, historically, if you want to look at the history, you'll find that uh, Germany had a nuclear program. So very quickly, I'll go over it. But uh, they were totally uh, uh, misguided in their efforts. They were not serious even about uh, the effort. This is a picture of Otto Hahn, uh, who with Fritz Strassmann had discovered uh, nuclear fission in Germany. And that's what uh, led to the paranoia of the United States of Germany uh, developing a nuclear uh, device. And that's what started the Manhattan Project. In reality, uh, there were some uh, 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 studies in Germany by some scientists like uh, Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker. Uh, he made a mistake, though. He thought that uh, it should be neptunium-237 as a fissile isotope rather than uh, like in the United States, plutonium-239. And uh, they built experiments, but they were subcritical uh, experiment. They did not reach uh, the critical stage. So they had uh, used basically metallic powder and uh, used as a moderator instead of graphite, like in the Chicago pile number one by Enrico Fermi, uh, they used heavy water that was uh, produced for them in Norway. So Norway produced heavy water. That's why they occupied Norway. And they built uh, basically a device also using graphite blocks uh, surrounding an unfinished reactor here. Uh, they thought to, that to build a device, they had to use a large reactor uh, with neutrons that are moderated. Uh, the uh, genius of Enrico Fermi, though, is that he built a fast reactor. What does it, do I mean by fast reactor? Uh, it was just a pure uranium-235 and pure uh, uh, plutonium-239. It didn't have a moderator. It didn't use graphite or heavy water. And the Germans thought that the device would be huge in size if you used 
a moderator, they never thought that you can have a fast reactor in the shape of a sphere of plutonium and uranium. Nevertheless, they did build a reactor, but it never became critical. And uh, you could see here a team uh, sent by uh, Leslie Grove. Uh, he called it the ALSOS uh, team, and they were dismantling by hand a reactor that the uh, Germans built at the village of Heiderloch uh, in Germany. All the uranium taken from that reactor was taken back to the United States for the Manhattan Project. In fact, the Germans had uh, uh, dumped or uh, <clears throat> or buried the uranium cubes uh, in that reactor. I'll show you a picture of it. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, retrieved by uh, the American military. Uh, this is a, a schematic of how they built the reactor. They had a tank that contained heavy water and then they had a lid. On that lid, they had cubes of uranium hanging uh, through a wire. And this is an actual picture of it. Uh, here is the lid uh, carrying those uh, chunks of uranium. Uh, if you visit Germany, you can go to that village of Heigerlach and they have a museum showing uh, how that uh, uh, the, the attempt of the Germans uh, to build a, a device. So this is a replica of the device in the museum there. So uh, it's left to prosperity and the history in general. Uh, the leader of the group uh, that uh, led the German effort uh, in the Second World War uh, was led by Werner von Heisenberg. Remember uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the uncertainty in energy and time is equal to the Planck's constant divided into two pi. Uh, that is a principle in physics. He was a nice, a very good theoretician, but he didn't have the experience of uh, building experiments like Enrico Fermi. So his reasoning uh, with a German scientist that uh, the reactor size using thermal neutrons or a moderator would be huge in size, hampered the effort uh, in general. And the Germans never reached any kind of significant progress. Even their uh, uh, reactor was uh, subcritical. It never uh, became uh, critical. Uh, some of them thought about the line of enriching uranium. Uh, this is Paul Hartrick. He in his laboratory, he built a small uh, centrifuge, uh, one way of enriching uh, uranium. <clears throat> uh, after the war, the British uh, gathered all those German scientists and uh, uh, they basically obtained information from them in a very, very smart way. Uh, they didn't uh, waterboard them to gain the information. What they did is that they placed them in the castle, they dined and lined them and they recorded their conversations. And in fact, uh, the Germans discovered uh, uh, they were on the wrong track, even though there is some uh, alleged picture here showing uh, a sphere of plutonium with uh, some kind of a plug being shot into it, which is totally <laughs> unworkable uh, because this plutonium using a gun barrel concept would not work. Uh, with plutonium, uh, you need really the implosion process, which uh, implodes the device at the speed of light. Uh, there were uh, rumors about uh, what they call the glocky or the bell uh, as an attempt uh, of using what uh, the Germans thought are torsional field to achieve nuclear fusion. But this is totally uh, unscientific. Basically, it was an attempt at simply uh, showing their leadership that they're doing something. Uh, it would led uh, nowhere. Uh, there were some uh, studies about uh, the use of fission fusion or a hybrid fission and fusion uh, in a Crookes glow discharge tube. So you'd have a D2O here, uh, a deuterium gas. Uh, if you cause a discharge in it, you could have uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, they had uranium metal fuels and uh, the deuterium would dissociate and uh, absorb some neutrons into the uranium. So that is the origin maybe of some of the experiments in what was called uh, in the last few years a uh, cold uh, fusion. Of course, that produced only a small number of atoms or nuclei, not anything serious whatsoever. So there has been a rivalry between uh, uh, a, um, an American scientist, Gutschmidt and uh, Werner von Heisenberg. And uh, uh, Heisenberg is uh, uh, in fact, has met with Niels Bohr, 
uh, in Denmark and uh, the Heiserberg suggested that the scientists in Germany would not work on the nuclear device that uh, he suggested that he's keeping them employed so that they are not sent to the killing fields on the Eastern Front uh, in Russia. Uh, but uh, there was uh, an attempt basically at reaching an agreement with the scientists in the United States not to uh, pursue nuclear fission in, in general. So there are different political accounts, uh, but in fact, they were on the wrong way. Uh, this is the experiment that uses a centrifuge in one of the lab by Mr. Hartek, uh, uh, but that is just experimental. You have seen the huge industrial process that the United States uh, follow. Uh, these, these are the critical masses that you could think of uh, for uh, uh, a core made out of plutonium to, uh, 239. It would be about uh, 11, 11 kilogram. And if you surround the core by reflector, uh, you can reduce that mass, critical mass to five to six uh, kilogram. If you use uh, a critical mass of uranium 235, it, it would be in the range of 56 kilogram. And if you surround it by an infinite reflector, it's 15 kilograms. So you could see here that plutonium is, uh, so to say, more economical than using uranium-235, even though some countries like uh, Pakistan and uh, North Korea and Iran are opting to use uranium-235. They are really on the wrong track there, but oh, they don't know it. Uh, better that they don't know what they're doing. Uh, in any case, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the causes of success uh, of Germany were based on their political uh, system. The scientists there were not serious at all about getting something really realized, whereas scientists in the United States were dedicated. And so it's, uh, it's basically the political process that led to Germany failing in uh, raise, uh, developing uh, fission. Uh, Japan also had a program, but it was also not very serious. It was some kind of uh, a fight between their Navy and their army. Uh, they had very good scientists. Uh, one of them, uh, of course, uh, we know about uh, the, uh, the United States embargoing Japan in terms of the oil uh, because of uh, Japan's incursions in Southeast Asia. Uh, this ended up with the attack on uh, Pearl Harbor shown here. And uh, what people don't know is that there was also uh, uh, a simultaneous effect. Now, nine hours after uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor on uh, the Clark Field in the Philippines, uh, uh, this is history that is some kind of uh, forgotten. And uh, uh, the, the, the leader of uh, the Japanese uh, uh, activity was Admiral Yamamoto. Uh, he planned the attack on Pearl Harbor. He has been educated in the United States. He warned the Japanese government that uh, uh, it is best not to wake up, in his words, quote, a sleeping giant, the United States. His advice was not followed. Uh, the war started with Japan and uh, his plane eventually was ambushed by uh, breaking the naval code by the United States. And uh, he was downed in the airplane uh, after breaking the communication code of the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese, as I said, had uh, very good scientists. Uh, some of them were in contact with uh, uh, people in the United States. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'll show you here uh, uh, their leading scientist uh, in that case was uh, Nikishima. Uh, I described for you the har Pearl Harbor attack, uh, but uh, uh, some aspects of the history of it, but uh, Yoshio Nishina was a leading scientist in Japan. You could see him here shown on a stamp. And uh, he also uh, studied in the United States. Uh, he had particle accelerators in Japan, but particle accelerators, as we know, in the Manhattan Project produced only gram quantities uh, of fissile material. It was not enough uh, to reach the level of an atomic device. Uh, some of the Japanese scientists even had uh, uh, the, uh, they didn't have enough food to feed on, so uh, they had gardens uh, growing potatoes around their labs. Uh, so there was some effort in uh, thermal 
uh, diffusion again uh, that was uh, a, a, a struggle between their navy and their army and they never really reach any serious effort whatsoever for instance the army had a program they called ni for nishina and that was using the teletron the electromagnetic enrichment project whereas the thermal diffusion was used by uh, their navy and they never coordinated their efforts they never really took it uh, very uh, serious there has been some uh, uh, of course it ended up with the poor uh, war with japan uh, ending uh, with japan fearing the incursion of russia by entering the war of the japanese northern islands so I, in uh, some opinions uh, su suggest basically that the uh, the war would have ended uh, uh, regardless of the bombing of japan and uh, japan was uh, trying to get itself out of the dilemma it had fallen into uh, japan and germany had some collaboration uh, some people suggest that a, a submarine designated as uh, U-234, uh, uh, which is Untersea Boot for submarine number 234. Uh, uh, interesting enough, it has nothing to do with the uranium. It was just uh, the name uh, uh, the Germans tried to send to Japan 560 kilograms of natural uranium uh, and uh, parts of a disassembled Messerschmitt 262. Uh, the submarine was intercepted, uh, intercepted at uh, the entry to the Mediterranean, and that basically ended the Japanese uh, effort. Uh, the impact on the post-war period is that uh, uh, Japan was uh, prevented from doing any nuclear research except the medical uh, part, and uh, uh, it developed uh, uh, the largest nuclear electric energy production capability after the United States and France. However, uh, the Fukushima event had uh, stop them using uh, nuclear energy until uh, uh, more serious, uh, uh, safer uh, uh, systems are built. So they are restarting their nuclear energy process on a more uh, time, more uh, 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 on a safer uh, level. Uh, so here we have covered three chapters. Uh, uh, this uh, process of discovery of fission uh, was followed by uh, fusion, and that would be the topic of our existing nuclear world. It is not just today the kiloton level of weapons from fission uh, that are available uh, uh, for warfare, but we are going. We find ourselves dealing with the megaton level of TNT. So that's a thousand times as much uh, in terms of yield and destructiveness as the weapons uh, that were used in the Second uh, World War. I'll stop sharing. Uh, for any questions in the uh, chat room, uh, uh, and uh, if not, I'll uh, go to our second part of the lecture on the introduction of uh, fusion or hydrogen or thermonuclear weapons. You can ask any questions in the chat room, I'll be happy to answer that. Okay, if there are no questions, I'll start sharing the screen and start our next chapter. Uh, the next chapter deals with what happens after uh, the use of the, uh, the nuclear devices from fission on uh, Japan. And uh, I came a scientist at the Lawrence uh, Livermore lab, Edward Keller is his name. And uh, he suggested that uh, uh, more energy can be produced uh, from the process of fusion uh, rather than from fission. In fact, uh, uh, the suggestion was a combination or a hybrid of fission and uh, fusion. So even though the world had uh, started moving into, uh, quoting the Bible here, turning their swords into plowshares towards the peaceful application of nuclear energy and containing the possible use by international treaties and uh, technical kind of expertise, uh, the uh, fear in that case came in uh, by the fear that the Russians, uh, after uh, reaching the same level of sophistication, 
in nuclear weaponry and testing the first nuclear device, uh, uh, fission device, uh, that uh, the Russians may develop uh, the fusion uh, type of uh, devices. Uh, this is uh, the only picture taken uh, of the Trinity nuclear test, the only color photograph. In fact, uh, it was taken by environmental physicist Jack Aby. And this is a sequence of how the uh, Trinity test occurred. Fireball, uh, grow in size, create a stem shockwave, and then uh, the mushroom uh, started rising into the, the sky. Uh, so uh, at some point, Edward Teller uh, convinced the United States Air Force uh, that uh, he, can, uh, he can build uh, even more powerful devices than the fission devices that uh, were used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki by using nuclear fusion. Uh, he got into conflict with Robert Oppenheimer who was in that case, the director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, uh, so the Air Force built especially uh, to Mr. Edward Teller, what is named today as the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory to explore these ideas of uh, fusion. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, uh, the nuclear devices had to be tested uh, and uh, a site at the Nevada, uh, uh, very close to Las Vegas was chosen for the testing. Uh, it was extremely glamorous at the time for people to watch those nuclear explosions. So you could see here a uh, group of people with their pickup trucks and cars standing on a hill outside of Las Vegas watching a nuclear test in the atmosphere uh, at the Nevada uh, nuclear test site. Uh, this is even a picture of a mother and a son looking out of their window at a nuclear explosion, you could see here the mushroom up in the air all the way from Las Vegas. It became something very, very uh, glamorous and uh, glamorous in the same way as uh, Miss, Miss uh, Atomic Bell, uh, Bomb Ballet uh, dancing there in the desert of Las Vegas with the mushroom showing up in the sky. And this is Lee Merlin who was Miss Atomic Bomb also uh, and the nuclear mushroom is up there uh, in the sky. So uh, what they didn't know is that they are being subjected to radiation from X-rays, gamma rays, and neutrons while uh, displaying those uh, interesting uh, feats of fame. Uh, following the, uh, the uh, uh, bombing of uh, Hiroshima uh, and uh, the events at uh, Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy worried about an attack by a nuclear weapon on a moored fleet in a harbor. So in that case, nuclear testing continued. This is an explosion that was carried underwater in a, an atoll in the Pacific. If you see atoll here is some kind of coral reef forming an island uh, where the, the waves are suppressed in the center. So people live on the atoll and uh, they can go up to sea for uh, fishing. And uh, they gathered the whole fleet. You could see here some of these uh, 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 ships from the Second World War, Mothballed uh, uh, ships, and some of them basically all the uh, uh, German and Japanese ships. And uh, they exploded a device to see what would be the effect of an underwater uh, explosion. Uh, you could see the effect here is that it creates a huge stem of water that rises up uh, in the air to the point that a ship that's very close to it was carried up by the stem. That water goes up and then falls down. And look at the size of the ship, finding a huge column of water from the sky falling on it. Uh, the test there was 21 kiloton of TNT equivalent. It was made uh, done at, uh, on July 24, 1946. And they used all kinds of uh, 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 code words, I called it the Crossroad Baker test. And it was surrounded by a fleet here. You could see the silhouettes of those ships. And here, 96 decommissioned ships uh, at the atoll uh, in the Pacific called the Bikini Atoll. And the name Bikini was adopted later on by some uh, uh, French uh, gentlemen and gave it to the name of the swimsuits named the Bikinis today. 
Uh, this is a sequence of uh, uh, video grabs, basically, of what happens when you get a nuclear explosion underwater. You could see that uh, the fireball is generated. It generates a stem. It pushes the water upwards. Uh, it goes up in the air and then falls back, uh, creates the equivalent of, it didn't generate really a tsunami, but uh, water falling back again. Uh, see, it raised here a whole fish up in the air, a whole ship all up in the air uh, can be extremely destructive depending on the distance of those 96 ships from the device itself. They also use animals, like these are boats. Uh, they used it on board the ships to study what is the effect of the radiation and the blast wave on them. Uh, this is uh, newly de uh, declassified pictures of the uh, Bikini Atoll decommissioned ships used in that nuclear testing. Uh, something just, just came out is uh, the effect of a nuclear device exploded on top of an aircraft carrier. You know that the surface of aircraft carriers use uh, wood. So obviously uh, uh, the uh, one of the uh, aircraft carriers, the Independence, was mothballed. Uh, the device uh, exploded on top of it. It's called the Gilda device. It was exploded 150 meters above the deck on November 2nd, 1952. Uh, another uh, aircraft carrier, the Saratoga, uh, also was tested, and you could see it here. Uh, it sank down after eight hours. So it's a very serious situation of using nuclear weapons against a moored uh, fleet. Uh, this is a battleship Pennsylvania that was retired. Uh, it was used in the testing at the crossroad uh, event. Uh, the Sakawa, uh, a Japanese ship from the Second World War was used, as well the Nagato, which was the largest ever uh, cruiser built in the world by uh, Japan and the Second World War, was also used in the testing, as well as the uh, Prince Eugen. Uh, ship that was used by the Germans. And uh, this is the hull of the ship still there in the Bikini Atoll. And it is now some kind, it's inhabited by uh, fish uh, and uh, scuba diving enthusiasts go there and do the scuba diving uh, around the, uh, the sunken ship. Uh, the experiments were meant to be to uh, check whether a, a fleet that is attacked by atomic uh, devices uh, like uh, in the style of the uh, Pearl Harbor can be decommissioned. You could see here they brought in a ship, uh, a fire, uh, uh, a fire uh, protection ship and they used hoses to try to decontaminate the surface from the radiation. And I don't think it was a successful event. So uh, the radiation stayed there. Testing also was conducted above ground by the United States Army. They used mannequins to see what will happen in a nuclear blast. They didn't know the effect, so they unnecessarily exposed Army and Air Force personnel and Navy personnel to radiation from this explosion. You could see here they exploded the device, and then they used uh, Army troops to go into the area uh, where the explosion has happened. So in that case, they exposed them unnecessarily unnecessarily to uh, radiation from the fission products. Uh, this is Air Force personnel uh, uh, wearing goggles to protect their eyes from the ultraviolet radiation, but they were asked to watch uh, the explosion face to face. Also goggles used by Navy personnel. Uh, they tried to kind of acclimatate them or get them uh, uh, desensitized against the use of nuclear weapons uh, in war. <clears throat> this is what the Army did. It exploded the devices uh, and then asked troops to go into the area where the explosion happened, unnecessarily exposing them to radiation. But they didn't know about the effect at the time. There were explosions in the high in the atmosphere, and you could see the effects are different. You don't see the same shape of a mushroom as on the ground. You see more or less like a huge uh, fireball. If you are high in the atmosphere, that's the fireball that you get. But the most important discovery is that if you do that very high in the atmosphere, you generate uh, a, what's called an electromagnetic pulse. Uh, the electrons produced from the device uh, uh, and the X-rays simply generate uh, uh, a monumental uh, uh, 
discharge of uh, voltage much, much stronger than any kind of lightning strike. So it can incapacitate a whole city. Uh, uh, all the electronic devices, like even electronics in cars would be damaged. So that can stop civilization back into the Stone Age. A single device uh, exploded over the continental United States in one megaton maybe can uh, uh, bring us the whole uh, central United States back to the Stone Age. No cars, no uh, electronics, no phones, no computers, no lights, no refrigerator uh, of food in general. This is uh, what looks like uh, an explosion uh, of a high altitude test. In that case, of course, uh, what we see here is the remnants of the, pro the materials used in the device itself. So the, the concern there is uh, what we call the EMP or the electromagnetic pulse. And uh, this is the uh, electromagnetic pulse uh, of one of those tests in the atmosphere, uh, causing uh, what looks like an aurora borealis uh, over Hawaii. It also uh, damaged some street lights, but uh, the electromagnetic pulse becomes a main uh, concern. Uh, this is uh, Air Force personnel also, where planes were positioned on an airfield and a device exploded on top of them to see how a nuclear device would affect an attack on an airfield. And uh, this is uh, uh, five uh, gentlemen from the Air Force. And if you look very carefully here, they basically are naming themselves the Gray, uh, the ground uh, uh, zero population. Uh, they had an airplane fly high above them and explode a nuclear device above them. Obviously, uh, the X-rays and the light move at the speed of light. So that's what they saw first. It didn't affect them, but a few uh, milliseconds uh, later, uh, you could see now the blast wave, the shock wave hitting them and uh, they can feel it. Uh, the army tested uh, uh, nuclear devices shown here in uh, cannons, uh, very uh, large uh, uh, cannons, and uh, you could see here the explosion. They called it the uh, upsh upshot nocle uh, uh, event where they had an air explosion by a device uh, shot from a gun at the Nevada test site. Uh, those explosions in the air, as you could see, generated lots of uh, radioactivity from the materials of uh, the devices themselves becoming radioactive as well as activating material from the ground, raising it to the atmosphere, spreading it all over the world. At some point, the effect from cesium-137, two isotopes of concern, and the iodine-131 became noticeable. So today we live with a, a, a banning on nuclear testing in the atmosphere. Uh, whole small cities were built to test the effects of nuclear devices. So this is a house built one mile away from a nuclear explosion. You could see the first thing that affect the house is the light from the explosion, but the light is followed by the X-rays and the X-rays get absorbed in the material of the house and basically ignited. So that house now uh, is on fire. Now, of course, you know that X-rays are electromagnetic radiation, so they travel at the speed of light. But then uh, moving at the speed of sound is the shock wave. It's uh, like a piston. It hits that ignited house in one direction. And uh, behind the compression of the shock wave, you get a rarefaction. So that house now is subjected to compression. It pushes the house to in uh, the direction away from the explosion. And then the rarefaction pulls it in the opposite direction. You could see here the top coming back. And in that case, it's like bending the house forward and then backwards and the whole thing disintegrates, literally disintegrates and is also on fire from the X-rays uh, before that. So it becomes extremely uh, devastating. This is about uh, one mile, uh, 3,500 feet from ground zero and uh, at the Yucca Flats now, and they call that up not, not whole uh, testing. Uh, they also tested the, the devices on, oh, they built, in fact, uh, they planted a whole uh, <clears throat> forest. And you could see what happens when they're exposed to the blast wave. They're bent fully to the right by a shock wave and then to the, uh, to the left and then to the right. A person standing in the way of that shock wave would be carried up in the air 
in this direction and, uh, with the compression part of the shock wave and then the tension part, he will be thrown back uh, in the other direction if he survives it. Uh, so uh, testing on radar systems on ships was done. You could see that the destructive destructiveness is very visible uh, uh, in that case. Uh, comes as I suggested, uh, uh, Edward Teller and uh, the United States knew that uh, the Russians were spying on the United States effort by one scientist from England of German origin, Klaus Fuchs. He passed nuclear secrets uh, include to the Russians uh, on ideological uh, basis. He thought that the United States should not be uh, the only uh, country monopolizing the knowledge about nuclear weapons. So he communicated it to the Russians uh, uh, in general. Uh, if we think about uh, 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 hydrogen weapons, uh, they're called hydrogen because they use isotopes of hydrogen, uh, particularly the deuterium and the uh, uh, tritium isotope. And uh, they started uh, studying the process, Edward Teller. And in fact, here at Illinois, uh, we built the first ever computer. It was named the Iliac. Uh, it used uh, uh, circuit breakers here on campus, uh, and uh, uh, they tested different ideas on how to ignite uh, a fusion reaction between deuterium and tritium using uh, the heat from a fission explosion. Uh, they tried many processes. They tested them on the computer. The computer, in fact, that we benefit from today is a spin-off of that effort because they built a computer to study the effects because they couldn't really go and test them. Uh, three ideas uh, were tested, uh, uh, shown here, I'll describe it to you. One, uh, due to Gamov, uh, from which we, got, uh, who wrote the book on the curve of binding energy, and he refers it as squeezing the cat's tail. So let us uh, look at a book by Gamov, uh, on how he describes these ideas uh, being uh, tested. Uh, so this is a diagram that he drew. Uh, he shows us here uh, Joseph Stalin. Uh, of course, uh, that is a Russian leader at the time, carrying an atomic bomb. And then he shows uh, Mr. Edward Teller here, uh, who was advocating the idea of using uh, thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs. They show Robert Oppenheimer with a halo around his head as a, uh, uh, an angel. Uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer was of the opinion that uh, a hundred kiloton device is enough to destroy any, uh, any uh, troop concentrations and uh, there is no need to uh, generate energy beyond that hundred kiloton. Uh, he suggested the use of what's called a spiked weapon where you uh, use some tritium and deuterium uh, uh, inefficient device to increase the yield maybe uh, to the level of 100 kilotons. So that's 10 times what uh, was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It seems to be right, was right at the time. But uh, there was a, a conflict aroused between Edward Teller and Robert Oppenheimer. Edward Teller accused him of treason uh, because he had a friend that who was a member of the Communist Party uh, at the time. And uh, Edward Teller had an idea uh, of using what's called the Naha kind of ornament that is used in the American uh, Southwest. This is a uh, Naha ornament here. Uh, uh, you could see it looks like a flower here. Uh, uh, a squash actually blossom, uh, basically in the center of some ellipsoid of revolution. When they tested this idea uh, uh, on the computer, the Iliac here in Illinois, in Champaign-Urbana, in fact, uh, the, the idea did not sound right. So Mr. Gamov came up with another idea, which is the idea of squeezing uh, the cat's tail. Let me show these uh, three ideas that I mentioned. Squeezing the cat's tail. Uh, Edward Teller referred to his idea as a womb, uh, one due to Stanislav Ulam, a mathematician who was involved in the Manhattan Project. He called it the spittoon. And uh, he's shown in the diagram here by Gamov uh, spitting into a spittoon. The three ideas uh, with computer simulation did not work by themselves. And then uh, uh, Stanislav Ulam shown him spitting into the spittoon. Uh, you know, the spittoon in the cowboy movies is there in the bars and after the 
cowboys chew their tobacco, they spit whatever is left into that uh, uh, ugly uh, spittoon. Uh, you'll find that uh, uh, Stanislav Ulam in his book, uh, History of a Mathematician, uh, suggests that he came up with a combination of the three processes uh, that uh, basically became known today as the uh, Ulam Teller configuration for uh, generating thermonuclear uh, uh, explosions. And uh, uh, some people have been speculating on the details, uh, but these are two diagrams, one in a book by a gentleman named Weinenberg. This is the part that would be uh, uh, the part that uh, Mr. Edward Teller thought about. It used uh, uh, an ellipsoid of revolution. An ellipsoid of revolution has two focuses here. And if you have a fission device exploded here, the radiation from it would reflect uh, from the walls of the ellipsoid of revolution into a focus that contains deuterium and tritium. And the deuterium and tritium would fuse together and uh, generate X-rays and radiation inside a long cylinder here made of a heavy element, uranium-238, surrounding a material of lithium deuteride. Uh, de deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen, that's why it's called the hydrogen bomb, and lithium-6 would interact with the neutrons generated from the fission process. I'll show you uh, the reaction in that case when we deal with the chapter on nuclear reactions and produces tritium. Tritium is another isotope of, the, uh, of hydrogen. The deuterium and tritium would fuse together. The radiation would implode that large uh, cylinder uh, of uh, lithium deuteride, which is a powder in that case, uh, that's lithium hydride is a powder. And uh, you get in that case, a multi-stage amplifier. You start with a fission, then you cause fusion and the neutron from that DT reaction are so highly energetic that they can fission a casing of uranium 238 producing even more energy. So you get fission, fusion, fission again, and that is a process of what you would call in electronics a multi-stage amplifier. Uh, in more detail, you'll have to have a shield between the point where you have the fission explosion and the uh, point where you ignite the deuterium. Uh, and uh, you also would have in the center here uh, a, uh, a, a plug. Uh, they call it the, the plug, actually. Uh, made out of uh, maybe uranium-235 uh, or plutonium-239 that basically generates neutrons to interact with the lithium-6 uh, with, a, with a, uh, turning it into tritium with a, a deuterium. Uh, the radiation in that case here shown here would uh, propagate in just foam, uh, polystyrene foam. Uh, a whole realm is a black body radiator. Now, the interesting thing in that uh, kind of a configuration is this is that it looks like igniting the tip of a cigarette. So if you ignite the tip of a cigarette, the, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the, the burn propagates along the cylinder. So you can make that cylinder as large as you can. And if you make that cylinder as large as you can, you produce as much energy <laughs> as you can. And uh, that increases the yield from the fission device that could be say a few kilotons into 1,000 times the millions of tons. And that is basically what is called the Ulam Teller configuration. It is secret, uh, basically kept and being improved upon by uh, the nuclear uh, power uh, states right now uh, in uh, the world. So uh, to quote uh, Mr. Stanislav Ulam, uh, this is what he wrote in his book, Adventures of a Mathematician. You can find the book uh, at the uh, uh, I think the main library maybe, or the undergraduate library. I had a copy of it. I lent it to somebody. He never returned it to me. But in the book, Adventures of Mathematician, uh, Stanislav Ulam says, quote, perhaps the change came with an idea I contributed. I thought of a way to modify the whole approach by injecting a repetition of certain arrangement. Unfortunately, the idea or set of ideas involved is still secret and cannot be described here. So this certain arrangement basically came to be known as the Ulam Teller configuration, uh, and it became the turning point for thermonuclear reactions today. So we're not living with a kiloton uh, level of energy release from uh, reactions. 
uh, but in fact, we are living with the millions of ton release. What is the fusion reaction that would happen in a hydrogen bomb or a thermonuclear reaction? It's really the isotope of uh, uh, hydrogen deuterium, 1D2. It's a hydrogen that contains an extra neutron in the nucleus. It is stable to a certain extent, but it uh, is combined with tritium, uh, another isotope of hydrogen that does not occur in nature. And that tritium can be produced by the interaction of the, uh, of the neutrons with uh, the lithium-6 uh, shown in the diagram. After that diagram was put together, uh, I put this one together and Mr. Weinberg put this one together, it was discovered that the yield from those explosions testing came out at 10 times what was initially planned uh, because they really didn't need to use the isotope lithium-6. They could have used just simply lithium. Uh, uh, lithium contains two isotopes, lithium-6 and lithium-7, and the lithium-7 also interacts with the neutrons from the so spark plug here in the center, producing uh, uh, more tritium. So in that case, uh, the yield from the explosion would be bigger than was calculated. And uh, those neutrons can interact with uranium-238 and fission it again as a multi-stage amplifier. Deuterium plus tritium produces a neutron and an alpha particle. Uh, if you balance the equation, you say that the charges are conserved. We'll deal with that in the whole chapter. Conservation of charge one plus one should give you zero plus two. And conservation of nucleons gives me two plus three uh, is five. So that's one plus the four in the helium four. The lighter element here, hy hydrogen, inter interestingly carries the least amount of energy. And the lighter particle, the neutron, carries 14 million electron volt of energy. Now that is uh, seven times the energy of a fission neutron. So that's why it can fission that casing made of the more abundant isotope of uranium-238 around the thermonuclear uh, uh, weapon. Uh, uh, so that is really how uh, we are living in the nuclear age now. And uh, they carried out an experiment to test it. So they built basically a cryogenic factory. They didn't uh, use lithium deuteride as the powder initially. They used basically deuterium. And that would be both de deuterium plus tritium and deuterium reactions are going to be uh, the way that we can implement uh, uh, the ideas of thermonuclear devices into uh, future fusion peaceful reactors. So they had a cryogenic factory containing uh, the, the uh, high, uh, cryogenic deuterium and they placed several nuclear fission devices inside that big cylinder. Look here at the size of it. This is a gentleman here. Look at this gentleman sitting there. They had all kinds of tubing uh, uh, to measure the energy release in neutrons, x-rays, and so on. This is just uh, uh, measuring the device, but they think it was uh, really a big spark plug in the center of, uh, fish, uh, of fission devices igniting uh, the deuterium reaction. And it was exploded again in one of the, uh, you could see here an atoll is uh, a coral reef uh, forming an island with an atoll uh, uh, in the center here. Uh, because it's protected by, uh, from the waves of uh, the ocean. And uh, in that case, the device had a name. The name was the IV Mike device. It was exploded in 1952. And uh, remember the Hiroshima and Nagasaki were uh, devices in the range of 10 to 20 kilotons. Here we are talking 10 megaton. So this, the uh, energy release is not 10 times or 100 times. That's a thousand times. Uh, that happened now at what's called the Eniwetok Atoll. And uh, basically it was 500 times the yield from the Hiroshima device. Uh, and uh, the cloud, the mushroom cloud reached a height in the atmosphere of 100,000 feet. So all the radiation there basically propagated all over the world and the fission products uh, from the dust and the explosion covered the whole earth uh, in general. Uh, this was followed by other tests, uh, uh, and uh, obviously, if you cannot use liquid deuterium as a deliverable uh, weapon, you cannot put it on an airplane, a, cry a cryogenic system. So the Russians came up, and then the United States adopted the idea of using lithium hydride, but it is not lithium 
hydride with a hydrogen isotope. No, it's lithium deuteride uh, with the deuterium isotope. And you could see here uh, one of those devices uh, shown. Uh, and uh, basically, you can think about the configuration inside it. Quite a large device, so they had to explode it on a barge in the Eniwetok Atoll. So we'd have a fission device here igniting a thermonuclear part. And uh, it, as it takes the shape of a cylinder like here, you can make it as large as you can. Uh, this uh, basically the uranium surrounding the device here being fissioned by the, uran uh, the neutrons from the fusion reaction uh, contributed 80% uh, of the yield of the uh, device. This was called the Bravo test. Uh, they give each test some kind of a code name in that case. Now, on, on, uh, you could see here the device on a barge. Look at that gentleman there. He gives you an idea about uh, the size. Uh, what happened there was some kind of tragic. Uh, the meteorologists thought that the fission products uh, from the explosion uh, uh, would uh, uh, that the wind would carry them to an expanded part of the ocean that was not inhabited. However, uh, the winds uh, turned around and the fallout. Uh, covered 5,000 square miles in the Pacific and uh, covered two islands that were inhabited. And uh, in that case, uh, the people on that island were affected by the explosion. Not only that, but even people observing the explosion in a, a large uh, uh, bunker right here had to be evacuated from the bunker uh, uh, by helicopter using uh, bed sheets uh, to cover themselves from the fallout from the radiation. And that happened, as I suggested, uh, again in the Bikini Atoll. And uh, today, it's a tourist attraction. Uh, you could see here, welcome to the beautiful island, Bikini Atoll Republic of the Marshall Islands in the uh, Pacific. Uh, some crews were watching it on uh, uh, in a, uh, United States Navy ship. You could see here, loaded with people. Uh, the United States Curtis. Uh, Basically, it was also affected by the fallout that went in the wrong direction. And uh, uh, it also affected uh, one Japanese tuna fishing boat. It uh, was named the Lucky Dragon. Uh, one uh, of the sailors on the boat uh, saw what appeared as if snowflakes coming down from the sky. <laughs> and he was uh, some kind of astonished that there would be snow in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, one of these Crew, the crew members basically died from radiation. The tuna was taken to Japan. Uh, it was radioactive. It was withdrawn from uh, the market. It was, that was called the Bravo test. As a result, the inhabitants of these islands uh, were relocated uh, from the Bikini Atoll to other islands. And then uh, they went through an ordeal of going back and forth to their uh, initial uh, home uh, in Japan. As I suggested, the uh, thermonuclear weapons depend on that simple nuclear reaction. Not that that's not a chemical reaction, that's a nuclear reaction with two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, and that's why people call it the hydrogen bomb. Uh, the result from the uh, explosion was uh, several times what the theory suggested, and uh, that's because they used lithium-6 as a way of generating that tritium here. So a neutron plus lithium-6 produces tritium, and then the tritium uh, fuses. This is a fusion reaction with deuterium uh, to produce hydrogen and a neutron. And uh, they enrich the uh, lithium into that lithium-6 isotope, thinking that this is a reaction that happens, when in fact, the neutrons can also interact with the more abundant isotope of lithium-7 in lithium, and also produce tritium, and they were not aware of that. Even though the reaction is not exothermic, it does not produce energy, it takes energy, but they didn't know about it. And as a result, uh, the yield from the uh, explosion <laughs> was uh, several times what they thought it is uh, going uh, to be uh, uh, in that case. All right, so uh, I explain here uh, some explanations of why it is that uh, really, that explosion uh, it, uh, generated more energy than uh, expected from it. Uh, 
Uh, this uh, thermonuclear devices initially were huge in size. So they needed even larger bombers and the B-29 that carried the devices on Japan. This is one of those thermonuclear devices initially. It's called the MK-17 device, 25 feet in length, 21 tons casing. Uh, that was his first deli deliverable thermonuclear weapon. <coughs> Today they have been miniaturized uh, to the point where you could see two gentlemen here holding one of those thermonuclear devices. Very clearly you could see the, uh, the fission part here in the case of the shape of a sphere. So it uses plutonium as a trigger and the main charge here would be the thermonuclear, uh, the, the, the hydrogen uh, charge. Uh, to the point that these devices are so small that the W-80 uh, warhead can be carried by a cruise missile, in that case a Tomahawk uh, kind of a cru uh, cruise missile can carry it. And again, you could see the configuration here, the spherical part for the primer or the primary uh, fission part of the device and this would be the fusion part of the device. Remember that you can make that size of the cylinder as large as you can, like igniting the tip of a cigarette, so you can control uh, the yield by uh, that effect. Uh, this is a, a modern uh, shape of that uh, W-80 warhead uh, carried by a cruise missile, the Tomahawk. Now, these are uh, devices that carry only uh, like Mr. Oppenheimer suggested, from 5 to 170 kiloton of thermonuclear uh, power. Uh, however, there has been devices shown here, one of them shown here, look at this one. This one is 9 megaton, 9 million tons of TNT. Humanity is lucky that it hasn't been used on civilian population or cities in general. Uh, so uh, somehow uh, they are useless uh, for warfare. Uh, However, it is a large industrial complex. This shows you the detail of one of those devices, the W85, and the parts of it necessitate a whole uh, uh, industrial complex, each company making one of those little parts that are put together uh, to make those uh, uh, weapons. So it is not something that can be built in a basement of a non-national group. This is uh, the whole industrial capability of a nation uh, putting at work to develop this device. Uh, at some point uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, a magazine being uh, published there, uh, uh, the, it's called The Progressive, one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the reporters uh, undertook the task of finding out what happens in ther those thermonuclear weapon or their uh, design, and he published that uh, figure here showing basically the composition of a thermonuclear weapon a core of plutonium surrounded by the explosive lenses that we discussed today with a shield uh, and uh, a spark plug and the thermonuclear charge and the polystyrene uh, radiation kind of uh, container. Uh, and he suggests here also a, uh, a, a container that contains deuterium and tritium to control the yield of the device. So if you take some of that deuterium and tritium uh, into the core of the fission device, you can uh, uh, some kind of uh, tweak uh, the yield that you want to generate from the nuclear device. So if you want just to destroy a bridge, maybe use one kiloton. If you want to destroy a city, you'll make it a hundred kiloton by adding or uh, taking out that deuterium and tritium. As this caused the controversy, uh, the United States uh, uh, canceled uh, the issue of the magazine Progressor uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. At, uh, 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 and uh, there was lawsuits and he was discussing the secret of the whole thing is that it uses uh, soft X-rays. Uh, the soft X-rays generated by the fission process uh, implodes the, uh, by surrounding really in a, a whole realm it's called or a black body radiator. Uh, the fusion kind of uh, charge. And uh, they wanted to keep that secret. It's not secret anymore. Uh, so the uh, Mr. Uh, the gentleman who wrote this uh, uh, wrote a book, The Secret That Exploded. His name is uh, uh, Maurice uh, Moreland, I think. Uh, he shows us detail of the fission device and the thermonuclear charge. So uh, basically that's a Mark 15 uh, device. 
Uh, some uh, two configurations people do not agree upon for thermonuclear weapons. You can either have the fission device in the front uh, and put it uh, instead of a cylinder, you place another sphere that contains a thermonuclear charge. And these are really the reentry vehicles that are used in uh, on uh, ICBMs or intercontinental ballistic uh, missiles. Uh, MIRV stands for multiple uh, inter independent reentry vehicles. When you put the uh, heavy part, which is uh, plutonium in the front, the system becomes more stable uh, in flight. But it takes the shape of a peanut. Do you see here the shape of a peanut where uh, they suggest uh, basically that the explosion in the fission device uh, 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 triggers the explosion in the so uh, the fission device in the in the back sorry here that's plutonium 239 and the x-rays implode another sphere uh, in the front that would be unstable in flight because the heavy weight is not at the center of mass of the, the uh, gravity uh, center of the device some other configuration that uh, are shown in the literature, it's the opposite. They show the fission part in the front and then uh, the fusion part in the uh, peanut type of shape of a device. So that is the fission trigger and this would be the fusion part of the uh, device. So uh, they give it different names. There is lots of speculation, but in essence, it is the uh, device uh, suggested initially by the Stanislav Ulam and Teller, the Ulam Teller configuration. This is another device where the fission part is in the front and the fusion part is on the other side of the peanut uh, configuration. Uh, uh, I show you, oh, okay, so this is what uh, uh, the A1 megaton warhead exterior looks like. That's a W59. And this is a device that is carried by the Minutemen. Uh, Intercontinental ICBM is the name, Intercontinental Ballistic missile. This is another picture of a device, a W80, and it's a variable yield, as I suggested. You can dial it to be five uh, kiloton of TNT or 170 kiloton of TNT, depending on a container here at the bottom that contains deuterium and tritium that you dial up and add to, uh, at the spot to spike the device with thermonuclear reaction. These are other pictures of nuclear uh, warheads. And this is details of uh, a demolition charge. So that would be used, say, to destroy a bridge or a small uh, construction by, say, the engineers in the corps of engineer uh, in general. Uh, this is the tech specs or the technical specifications of the Minuteman 3 ICBM. Uh, it's made uh, by the Boeing company. You could see that uh, our large companies are involved in the military projects uh, big time. Uh, the range is 6,000 plus miles or 5,000 nautical miles. The speed is tremendous. It's hypersonic. Uh, it uh, flies at 15,000 miles per hour, which is Mach 23 uh, at burnout. Uh, the ceiling, it rises to 700 miles and comes back, back, back again into uh, the Earth. So it's very hard to intercept it. Uh, if you want to intercept something moving at Mach 23, 23 times the speed of sound, you need a rocket that flies <laughs> faster or uh, also a hypersonic rocket to intercept it uh, in, in general. Uh, it's uh, not expensive. Uh, each unit uh, of that size is $7 million. So a nation that wants to save on its military budget, unfortunately, uh, would have it uh, cheaper to develop thermonuclear uh, devices uh, in general. The interesting thing uh, is uh, the question on whether that uh, number that they give here uh, about the uh, MAC 23 is real or not real. And uh, then uh, what is the time that it takes for an ICBM from the point that it is launched to reach its destination on the other side of the globe? So we do here a simple calculation and uh, to check it out, uh, we take the, uh, 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 that speed at burnout, which is considered as Mach 23, is some kind of very intriguing. So if you take the Earth radius as uh, 4,000 miles, we know that. Uh, you can calculate the circumference of the Earth twice pi r, that's 25,000 miles. The distance to be traveled should be uh, from one part of the uh, hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, to another part. So the distance traveled around the circumference could be in the range of less or equal to half 
the circumference. So the distance traveled by a typical ICBM should be the circumference of the Earth, 25,000 miles divided into two. So the range uh, is in the range of 12,566 miles. Uh, this is double the reported range, uh, which is 6,000 plus uh, miles. Now the reported time for an ICBM to travel from the continental United States is about half an hour. Uh, so to cover that distance D, uh, we are going to take uh, that D, not the D prime or 6,000 miles, uh, is basically can be calculated by taking the 6,000 hour estimate and the larger estimate 12,000 uh, miles divided into uh, the 50.5. Uh, 30 minutes is half an hour. So you take miles divided into uh, uh, 0 0.5, uh, uh, half an hour. So the speed is in fact, 12,000 to 25,000 miles per hour. This is a lower estimate. This is a higher estimate. So if you take the average, the average, the two of them added together, that's 18,566 miles. Now the speed of sound uh, at uh, uh, corresponding to a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius uh, is 340 meters uh, per second, which we can turn into kilometer per hour and then into miles per hour, that's 761 miles per hour. So in fact, the average speed is 18,000 miles per hour divided into the speed of sound, uh, 761. Remember that the speed of sound depends on the altitude. Uh, and you find that indeed uh, you get uh, 18,000 divided into 761. That our estimate is at 24.4 max. So this means that the, on the average, our rocket travels at 24 times the speed of sound. So that checks out indeed that when they say uh, it is hypersonic, ICBMs are hypersonic uh, with a Mach number of 23 uh, is uh, true uh, in general. So what happens then with the uh, development of thermonuclear weapons is that uh, uh, the world found itself into an arms race. The arms race developed between the NATO nations, uh, Europe and the United States, uh, as well as uh, 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 the so old Soviet Union, which is Russian, Russia and the surrounding uh, uh, republics. And uh, uh, the Cold War developed into uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, as I suggested, hypersonic. Uh, they developed it to have not just one single warhead. They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The latest ones have even 12. One developed by the Russian, 12 uh, warheads. Uh, MERD, MERD means that uh, multiple interdependent uh, re-entry uh, vehicles, and you could see one of them here. Uh, they take the shape of that conical shape because they, the return to Earth would be from the bottom uh, facing uh, the Earth uh, to direct them towards their targets. They are given a gyroscopic motion, so they have small rockets at their bottom here, as you could see, that make them uh, rotate. Uh, reaching their uh, destination. And uh, uh, to tool up their defenses, uh, anti-ballistic missile defenses, ABM is the abbreviation for it. Uh, there are basically, they are uh, associated with inflatable decoy so they can confuse the defenses uh, 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 in that case. And uh, you notice lots of acronyms here that we are using ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, ABM, anti-ballistic missile and so on and so on. Uh, we are living that area now. It is not just the United States and the Soviet Union. You'll find that the arms race and the Cold War spread to other countries. So this is the British uh, showing up one of their uh, uh, devices. You could see the shape of their actual device here that they issued an actual picture of the device with the initiator surrounding it uh, basically, this is a spherical implosion. They suggested it was thermonuclear because they added to it some deuterium and tritium. And indeed, it approached really uh, the level of the one megaton. It released 720 kilotons of energy. It wasn't just, uh, and they show you even more detail about their design here, the assembly of their weapon. So the knowledge there is up in the open literature. There is nothing secret. secret uh, uh, Mr. Moreland was right to say that the secret uh, of the thermonuclear devices has exploded. 
uh, Britain uh, joined the nuclear club and was followed immediately by France. Uh, France exploded its devices uh, in North Africa, in the Sahara Desert, in one of uh, the col its colonies at the time, Algeria. And uh, then when Algeria obtained its independence, they found their way going to the Pacific. So the only uh, the devices uh, exploded in the uh, southern hemisphere were uh, by France in the island of Tahiti, uh, as well as some explosions in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in Australia, in the desert of Australia. Uh, uh, this is how India now uh, uh, joined the uh, the club, and uh, India joined the club with its. Uh, fission devices that used plutonium-239 was immediately followed by Pakistan developing uh, its own nuclear device. In that case, they used uranium-235. And then lately, we have to deal with the problem of North Korea also developing uh, their own device. Uh, the North Koreans uh, uh, are trying very hard to be taken very seriously. They show a picture of their thermonuclear device. You could see here <laughs> that fission part uh, actually, that would be the fusion part, the shape of the uh, peanut, uh, and that would be the fission part. And they show something that is not shown uh, on, in the Western literature, which is that really electronic system that uh, generates the uh, implosion of the fission device. And uh, when they showed those pictures, they were trying to be taken seriously. Uh, you see that picture on the wall uh, that uh, some people have uh, magnified, I did it uh, myself, and uh, you could see that indeed this is uh, a device where the electronic part is right here shown and it is not shown in the open literature. So a thermonuclear device uh, is usually uh, three parts. Uh, one part would be the fission part that ignites the fusion part with very important electronics. Electronics here would be capacitors that discharge a charge to the initiators that start the fission reaction. Not only that, but North Korea also have added delivery systems uh, in rockets that they have been testing and causing a conflict with Japan and the United States because they have them fly over uh, Japan. So this is uh, this is a mobile launch ICBM in the uh, Democratic uh, People Republic, uh, which is uh, North Korea uh, in general. Uh, the leadership, of course, uh, uh, in the case of thermonuclear war is well protected in bunkers. This is a bunker that was built. Now it's a tourist attraction for, uh, in that case, President John F. Kennedy. You could see it's very deep in the ground, having blast walls here. Even if it's targeted as a nuclear weapon, they are very well protected. So the leadership of countries uh, protect themselves against uh, ahead of the whole population. Uh, testing has been also uh, uh, prominent, you could see a fireball here exploding over in some troop uh, concentration by of military vehicles. Uh, testing continued in the atmosphere. And then uh, at some point, the uh, testing in the atmosphere was banned because of the release of radioactivity. So it was switched underground. So this is an underground test in the desert of Nevada. Uh, you could see that it generates a cavity, then the cavity collapses. So you find that he gets a ground subsistence uh, right there. Some people thought about uh, using nuclear devices for peaceful applications. A very huge release of energy can be used to build canals, to build harbors. Uh, uh, in fact, the dams were built in Russia using a thermonuclear device, uh, 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 increasing the production of uh, petroleum from the ground by uh, nuclear fracking, if you want to call it, by fracking the medium. And the uh, experiments were run on what was called the plowshare program. The plowshare here stands for turning their swords into plowshares, reference, I think, in Timothy 3 in the uh, Holy Bible. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, testing in the Nevada desert, for instance, exploded what in a test that was called the Sedan test. You could see it's an explosion. Uh, uh, buried explosion is not above ground and you could see the huge crater that it can form that could be a lake a dam or if you explode those devices in a row you can build a canal and uh, you could see here are some people there at the edge of the uh the, the crater 
if you explode it uh, underground, as I suggested, in, in fact, two tests were run in the United States and several tests in Russia, you can enhance the production of hydrocarbons. Uh, this is the initial idea of fracking, where you explode the device uh, in the United States to experiment at two places uh, uh, in New Mexico and Colorado, uh, an experiment called the gas buggy uh, experiment and one called the Rulison experiment exploded devices in gas, natural gas fields. You could see that you form a cavity, you form cracks in the medium that enhances the production of the gas or the oil. Uh, the Russian tried it for oil. So you can, uh, usually you only uh, uh, exploit maybe uh, 15 to 20% of the existing supplies of hydrocarbon uh, using this uh, nuclear explosives. Uh, in a plowshare type of a program, you can get maybe another 20 or 30%. So you can double uh, the reserves of oil and hydrocarbons in uh, the earth. So that can replace fracking. But the interesting thing is that if you explode those devices in a single row, uh, you can create a canal. And the uh, ideas of building an alternative Suez Canal uh, between Asia and Africa, or a canal to re uh, replace the Panama Canal. You know that the Panama Canal is not a sea level Canal. The Panama Canal uh, is uh, basically a set of locks and dams. They, they raise the ship from one side, they put it into a freshwater lake, Gatun Lake, and then send it to the other side from the Pacific to the Atlantic or vice versa, and then lower it with the uh, locks and dams. Uh, if you explode nuclear explosives in a straight line, you can have a sea level canal. You can connect, reconnect the Pacific to the Atlantic, uh, for instance. Uh, the advantage here is that. Uh, 22 million years ago, uh, the Earth had a much milder climate than what we had today when the Pacific and the Atlantic were connected together. So if we get a running out uh, global uh, warming, humanity has a solution here is reconnecting the Atlantic to the Pacific. And in fact, you can get a, a potential drop of the water from the Pacific to the Atlantic in that case, you can also produce electricity from such a canal. It's an idea that hasn't been implemented, but it may be something in what's called terraforming, how uh, to form the Earth uh, in, uh, for uh, the future in general. Uh, the use of uh, thermonuclear weapons have been uh, controlled by uh, many treaties. For instance, we, we have the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It's an international treaty banning all nuclear explosion whether it's for military or plowshare problems. So that uh, treaty banned basically the peaceful application of nuclear uh, explosives in general. There has been clandestine testing, uh, particularly by South Africa uh, uh, and uh, Israel. Uh, that was detected by uh, a satellite uh, called the Vela satellite by the United States. That satellite is shown here uh, and uh, basically Vela means a sail in uh, Albanian, and uh, an event happened on September 22nd, 1979, where the Vela satellite detected a situation where it sh show, that showed two pulses of gamma radiation. Now, in the case of lightning, uh, because of course that would be caused by the electromagnetic pulse, you get only one pulse. Uh, in a nuclear explosion, you get two pulses, one from the gamma rays that come from the explosion itself, and then by secondary gamma rays that come from the fission product. So uh, that uh, signature definitely shows uh, a double, uh, uh, basically, explosion uh, testing uh, in South Africa. South Africa has uh, basically con uh, discontinued its uh, nuclear weapons program. Brazil had one too, they discontinued it too. Libya had one, they discontinued two. Uh, the one that is still remaining is uh, the uh, North Korea, of course, uh, Israel, and a suspected attempt, but no existence of nuclear weapons in uh, Iran. So the world is still living uh, in that nuclear dilemma, not just uh, fission weapons uh, or nuclear weapons. The United States is adopting what some people designate as a counter proliferation regime. Uh, that replaces uh, an international agreement of non-proliferation regime uh, governed by the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency agreement with 
a treaty called the NPT. NPT stands for a Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty. Uh, countries in the world uh, signed that treaty, uh, uh, commit themselves not to use nuclear weapons in, uh, in uh, favor of getting help from the nuclear power states develop their uh, peaceful applications. Uh, nevertheless, nuclear weaponry is part of the international picture. Uh, in fact, at some point, uh, just very recently, the threat of using uh, nuclear weapons against other countries, uh, that's uh, a show of force here. A B-1 bomber, a B-2 spirit stealth, and the B-52 shown uh, basically at, uh, uh, at Guam uh, as a way of uh, response to a threat by North Korea to use an, a weapon with an electromagnetic pulse over the continental United States. So the Cold War continues uh, in different uh, formats. Uh, it is a threat to all of us. Uh, this is an intercontinental ballistic missile, so, uh, and uh, even uh, the systems that can be launched by nuclear submarines. Those ICBMs are huge, as you could see the gentleman standing right next to the uh, a retired uh, peacemaker, and they can also be launched from uh, underwater from nuclear uh, submarines. As, uh, you could see even some systems were uh, developed as a David Crockett here, uh, that is a very low yield device, 20 tons only, not kilotons, but 20 tons of TNT equivalent. So this uh, uh, basically has been uh, retired in general. Uh, uh, the threat is uh, real. <laughs> there is a cartoon that I show here. Uh, many people are trying to join the nuclear club, but it is an exclusive club. And basically they reserve the right to uh, refuse service to anyone and the law for the probability of becoming a nuclear uh, a club member is really one over P. Uh, the main uh, uh, possessors of thermonuclear weapons is Russia with 7,000 nuclear strategic warheads, the United States 6,800. Both of them can destroy uh, all the capitals, all the cities of the earth, not once, but several times. Other countries, France 300, China 270, the UK 215, Pakistan 130, India 120, Israel 80, and we don't know how many uh, we have in North uh, uh, Korea. Uh, you notice that uh, uh, this is the largest atomic weapon, uh, thermonuclear weapon ever exploded. Uh, it was named the Tsar Bomba, and it was designed uh, by the Russians as a thermonuclear weapon. And at the last moment, they discovered that the energy release can be 100 megatons, 100 megatons. And the scientists uh, argued among each other and they reduced the fusion yield and, uh, to only 53 or 55 megaton of energy. And that became the largest thermonuclear weapon ever de uh, uh, designed. It, as uh, suggested, uh, it's 58 megaton. Uh, the super bomba uh, is shown here. You could see it was eight meter uh, in length, and uh, it was uh, dropped from a Tupolev 95. Uh, and basically, the crew has been subjected to some radiation from the device. So we live under the threat of those types of bombs. Uh, this is a nuclear device tested. The shape here you could see of a cylinder being put uh, in a shaft underground. But right now, nuclear devices are maintained by simulations on supercomputers. Supercomputers, in fact, uh, are being built, especially uh, in what's called the stewardship program. Uh, this is the W80 warhead uh, uh, in the United States. There have been false alarms uh, and uh, of uh, nuclear war occurring. And when you have a near miss, the name for it is Broken Arrow. And uh, that name has been used for a movie uh, that you can uh, spend some time watching. Uh, this is a device that uh, was dropped unintentionally in North Carolina. Uh, two devices, in fact, fell, one by parachute. That one was retrieved, as you could see here. And uh, another one uh, went deep into the ground. So it is still there in the ground, rusting. And uh, if you visit uh, North Carolina near Goldsboro, you find that a big sign, B-52 transporting two nuclear bombs crashed, uh, widespread disaster averted, three crewmen died three miles south of where it happened. 
uh, over the United States now as a result of that incident. Uh, no uh, uh, thermonuclear weapons are carried on any uh, airplanes flying over the continental United States. You don't want the bomb to fall over Chicago. However, uh, uh, the threat of nuclear war is still there. Uh, the president of the United States is followed by an officer carrying what's called the football uh, bag uh, containing uh, uh, communication devices to launch nuclear war wherever the uh, the president is. So that is a football leather suitcase. So the threat is still there. Uh, we are living with it. It is an existential threat for all of humanity to be wiped out by uh, said nuclear war. So what we are living today is a policy of what's called the mad doctrine or the mutually, mutually assured destruction. And uh, other incidents were uh, averted uh, 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 for instance, uh, at one point, some uh, experiments on weather satellites uh, were thought by the Russians as being uh, an attack on Russia, and it was averted by uh, the uh, basically the officer in charge uh, not responding to it. Uh, I'll uh, stop uh, at that point, and uh, next time I'll come back to the topic of the fact that we are live, reliving uh, a new arms race. And the arms race in that case is uh, uh, between the, uh, the, the Western nations uh, and uh, the Alliance of NATO, North Atlantic Defense Treaty, as well organization, and uh, Russia, as well as China. And in that case, we are not out of the shadow of uh, thermonuclear. War. It's as much of a threat as global warming, uh, a threat that also humanity can control, uh, uh, as well as the pandemic that we are all living in. I'll uh, write you some uh, 